All right, so let's, um, I guess the appropriate place to start is with you, Jay. Um, we'll talk about General Electric coming to Boston from Fairfield, Connecticut. It's They're home. coming to Boston? Uh, haven't you? I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I didn't hear that. <laughs> Leaving Fairfield after 40 years. Uh, what, does, what does GE's decision say about the Massachusetts economy, not only today, but in the future? So uh, some of you may guess that I'm a basketball fan. <laughs> and I've been thinking about uh, GE coming and how I could best uh, peril, uh, come up with a parallel. And I think of GE coming to Boston the way that I think of Kevin Garnett coming to the Celtics. Uh, the Celtics at the time were already a very good team, uh, a playoff team uh, with uh, stars on the team. Uh, but when Kevin Garnett came, uh, we had a, a Hall of Famer coming. Uh, that uh, put the Celtics over the top and, and created a, a dynasty uh, for the Celtics for the period of time that the big three were together. I think of GE the same way. So the first thing I want to say about GE is I want to thank everybody in this room uh, for helping us to bring GE here. For uh, some places around the country, uh, they woke up yesterday and they said, wow, Boston has arrived. It didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen over years. It didn't happen over decades. Um, for generations, we have all been building uh, what is special about Boston. And I say generations because, you know, it dates back to when GE first started here. GE actually contributed to the success that brought him here um, uh, many, many, many years later. Um, all of you are part of the ecosystem. We're all um, part of the ecosystem that rely upon each other uh, for growth and uh, can allow us to then uh, project out to the rest of the world uh, why Boston is so special. Specifically to your question, um, innovation is our number one calling card. Uh, Bloomberg recently um, again announced that uh, Massachusetts is number one in innovation, beating some valley somewhere on the west coast. And um, that innovation is going to be the difference maker uh, for us going forward. Uh, we're all aware of, of uh, communities and, and states uh, that are rusting away. And uh, yet here in Massachusetts, we continue to reinvent ourselves and continue to excite Companies like GE, a, a national leader, an international leader that can go anywhere, uh, we continue to excite them about the opportunities that exist in Boston. GE is looking at locations on the seaport, which has its own issues with traffic. Um, but looking down the road, GE has got to be a magnet for many other companies. So I will notice, note that the looking down the road is a pun, no pun intended, right? <laughs> looking down the road, a magnet for other companies. Um, you know, as my, my planning days in the city, one of the things we used to say is the, way, the best way to solve a problem is to make it worse. Um, so um, I am um, not an apologetic uh, person when it comes to uh, traffic. Um, I love traffic. Uh, uh, Barry Bluestone will tell you stories of old Detroit and all the traffic that existed. And today, you can get from uh, point A to point B in Detroit pretty quickly. Uh, you decide which, uh, which uh, environment you want to be in. Uh, we're going to solve a lot of problems um, because um, we have um, um, thoughtful people in this room and elsewhere uh, that are working together. And I want to I highlight the working together as it relates to GE. Uh, GE is here because of innovation. Uh, GE is here because of our, uh, our great um, educational institutions. Um, GE is here because of many of you and the relationship uh, they're going to have uh, with you. Uh, GE is also here because uh, we have two very special leaders um, in the Commonwealth who uh, are working together like none ever, ever have. Um, and we're able to um, project to a company that was looking to go into a stable environment to grow uh, that, in fact, stability is here. Of course, I'm referencing uh, Governor Baker and, and Mayor Walsh. Um, I've been in politics all my life, uh, li almost literally all my life. Uh, first campaign, I was age 10. Um, I've never seen two leaders. Uh, working so closely together, let alone two leaders from opposite parties uh, working so closely together. Uh, so um, we were able to project uh, to GE um, a unified uh, and, and um, I, I want to say comprehensive um, uh, approach to uh, what the economy can be in Boston, what the economy can be in Massachusetts. And now that GE is here, uh, we expect to see more of what you saw with uh, the AstraZeneca uh, model of, of mentors, big companies, uh, working very closely with startups. Uh, we ex expect to see the startups benefiting uh, from the experience and expertise that um, people who have been in the industry uh, uh, have. And, and we expect it the other way around. We expect that the 
uh, the older ones among us are going to uh, be able to benefit from the energy, the insight, and fresh ways of looking at things that small startups bring. So I just want to make sure I understood traffic is a good thing? Traffic is a great thing. <laughs> uh, traffic is a great thing. And uh, uh, Secretary Lapori, who was uh, uh, central to um, us working on the uh, GE project, um, is also central to uh, not only solving the billion dollar budget problem Rick Lloyd identified, uh, but solving traffic as well. So if you're pleased that GE is here, <laughs> thank me. And if you have traffic problems, ask the Secretary of Administration and Finance for some more dollars uh, to fix your infrastructure. Well said. Okay, let's turn um, attention to uh, Martha. One of the um, subjects in Rick's speech was uh, finding talent. That has always been an issue, and I know that today the challenges are greater than ever. How do you stay ahead of it? How do you find the right skilled people? Yeah, great question, and issue near and dear to all of us. L let me just start by saying it is one of the, the more important challenges that we have. I think to put that in context, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Sansada. And I'm going to keep it down to two things. The first thing is um, our name comes from our focus, which really is in sensors. And so when you hear things about the connected world and smart cars and the Internet of Things, sensors are very much the heart of that. Um, so it's an exciting place to be, and it's a place with a lot of growth and a lot of opportunity. The second thing I will tell you is that we are celebrating our centennial. We are a 100-year-old company. Now, those things may seem very much in conflict. It's probably not a big surprise that we were not focused on sensors 100 years ago. <laughs> we were a metals, precision, machining-oriented type business. So whatever we'll say, I think, as a panel about how we can constructively influence the cooperation between state and business, I think you have to recognize that after 100 years, to be a $3.5 billion business with 1,000 employees in the Commonwealth does say something about the environment we're in. I think more important than anything, though, is what businesses have to do to create the talent and attract the talent. And any, all of you know that. 90% of it is about what you do in your shop. It's about having a strategy that adapts with the environment, with the demands, that is compelling, and having a vision that attracts talent. We focus on solving the world's needs for a cleaner, safer, more efficient environment through the use and the application of sensors. It's a pretty compelling vision and environment. You have to have a culture that is welcoming, that has diversity of talent, diversity of thought, and diversity of background, and is focused on winning. And that's really, really important. And thirdly, you have to have the bandwidth to execute. It is not easy to stay alive for 100 years and to be a leading provider in the world, growing at the rate of 50% uh, from three years ago. That's not easy to do, and it, create, it requires a lot of execution and focus. So what becomes important, then, in, in working together in the Commonwealth to attract talent? We talked about infrastructure. Infrastructure, when you're sitting where we are, which is in Attleboro, Massachusetts, which is not in that urban center of Cambridge and Boston. Infrastructure is hugely important. We've been really encouraged by the focus on performance at MBTA. We think that it, that's, that's really important for Sensata and for many other companies. Um, I'd say the second uh, most important um, aspect of this is to have collaboration before legislation. And it's not an either or choice, but collaboration is hugely important one of the issues that is very near and dear to me, I'm an engineer background. Most of the people that we have working in Massachusetts are engineers. So the promotion of women in STEM, in careers, in education, in pay is hugely near and dear to my heart and near and dear to our company. I'd love to give you a great example of collaboration. Uh, we had Joe Kennedy on our campus not too long ago. Joe's background is an engineer. And when we brought in all the initiatives that we're doing in STEM and looked at the initiatives that he had going on, there was lots of room for, for cooperation and collaboration. So when you look at how hard and how much work you have to do to bring along great talent out of the engineering pools, and the idea that you would not reward that talent based on meritocracy, based on performance in an inequitable way, is just a really bad business decision. So let's think about you know, cooperation before legislation. 
Um, lots of, of, uh, of other examples of that as well. Uh, I would say the, um, uh, the, the, the third element of, the, of what becomes really important then is just the overall, let's make it a place where families can grow and businesses can thrive. And you talked about that uh, in your early remarks, um, Rick, about the affordability factor. Do you find that you're, as a company, and maybe even you specifically, spend more time these days in finding talent than you did, say, 10, 15 years ago? I would say we, um, it's not just the time, it's also the quality of that bandwidth. And so we really have appropriately, I think, upped our focus on what does it mean to not just attract and retain the best, you know, but to have them grow and have them thrive. And, and that, that used to be the HR function. That's not the HR function alone. I spend a lot of time on it myself. Most of our leaders do. We think that that's, that's really important piece of it. What becomes important then is you look at what you do with that talent. So our business is one that's, we call it a long cycle business. So as much as we're focused on technology, our businesses have life cycles that you measure in decades. And so the know-how and the development and the years of collaboration that happen in-house to create those products and the competitive information that goes with that is really important. And being able to, to protect that competitive information is another area that's really important to us. So yes, we spend more time on it. Once in place, we do a lot to make sure that that's aligned with the interest of the business. Okay. Dr. Grant, let's turn to health care. This, um, this is something that affects everybody. It, it affects businesses, it affects employees, and it's expensive. And a lot of people don't understand what they're buying. Yeah. How, do we, how do you as a company, first of all, uh, you know, maintain a quality health at affordable health care? So, Rick, I'm really pleased to hear that the um, average income in Massachusetts is 128% of the national average because the cost of health care in Massachusetts is 36% higher than the national average, which means that there's an increasing gap between people's ability to pay <laughs> and what they're earning yeah, yeah. going forward. And Jeff, you're right. It's an incredibly complicated um, uh, issue from most people's perspective. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. I, I was uh, coming out of the airport a couple weeks ago, and the cab driver prodded me to ask me what I was doing uh, going to Leahy. I said, well, I work there. I work in healthcare." He says, um, with a bunch of four-letter expletives, he said, you got, you got real problems. And I said, oh, really, what are the problems? He said, I've got a health policy where I've got a huge deductible. I was impressed with the fact that he even understood what the deductible was. Um, and he said, I was told I needed to have something done. And he said, I started making phone calls. And he said, there was a 400 times difference between what one place charged versus what another place charged. And I said, well, what'd you do? He said, and we were just passing the Burlington Mall at the time. He said, well, if there were two stores and you looked in the windows of the two stores and the same product was in the window of each store and one of them was selling it for four times more than the other one, which store would you go into? He asked me. I said, I'd probably go into the cheaper store. Um, you, we, all have a responsibility to be educated about the discrepancies that exist within the Commonwealth in the cost of care, which everybody is paying for. Rick, you referenced the challenges associated with lower income communities and economic growth in those communities. You look at the gateway cities, Lowell, Brockton, New Bedford, I think of um, communities with superb, high-value hospitals delivering care which is of comparable quality by any objective metric. And the employers in those communities and the residents of those communities who make value-driven choices to receive their care in lower-cost settings are paying for the care that's being um, chosen by people who live in higher income communities who are going to higher cost settings. We need to do something about it and the reason why we need to is because the business proposition today for most health care providers is not sustainable. 20 years ago, 130 hospitals in Massachusetts. Today, there are 63 hospitals in Massachusetts. In every one of those communities where a hospital closed, it was the largest employer, 
It was the provider of the best paying jobs with the best benefits and the best pensions for the people who worked in those hospitals. And in almost every case, the quality of care that was getting delivered by those institutions was comparable to every other health care provider in Massachusetts. Um, national average, 16% of Medicare recipients get their care in academic, high-cost settings. Massachusetts, 40%. Two and a half times the national average. It doesn't need to be that way. Now, I don't want everybody running out of here and saying Dr. Grant's critical of academic medical centers. Um, we have world-renowned, spectacular centers in Boston, of which we should be enormously proud. With that said, a disproportionate amount of care in the Commonwealth is getting delivered in high-cost settings, and everybody's paying for it, and it's not necessary that we do so. We can have the quality, be world-class in our care, be world-class in our research and education, but not bear so much more costs than everybody else in the yeah. country. It's, you know, everybody talks about it, but I mean, well, how do you, where do you go yeah. from here? Yeah. Well, they're, 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 um, everybody's got a responsibility. Number one, government's got to continue, and I think the, the state has done a marvelous job um, being more transparent than almost any other state in the, in the, in the country and providing information, valuable information, about cost and quality. And the government needs to continue to do more and more. I insurance companies, and I know the sponsor today is Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, need, need to be driven by employers to create innovative health plans that provide you and your employees with information about how you can make value-driven decisions about where you get your care. And they can be very, very innovative and provide significant financial incentives, informed financial incentives to your employees about how they make um, those decisions. Um, and consumers need to be educated, like my cab driver. He made a decision because it was his money, and he was going to make a wise choice to get the same quality at a considerably lower cost. And then finally, we've got a, Jeff, we've got a really serious um, challenge in the Commonwealth with significant price disparity. And the uh, legislative initiative of three, four years ago, known as Chapter 224, which was intended to lower the overall growth of health care costs in the Commonwealth, I think in part has been successful, um, although costs appear to be going back up again at an, an accelerated, accelerated rate. We had a couple of years where costs were down a little bit, but you're all going to be facing significant premium bumps this year because costs have started to escalate again. Um, Chapter 224 fixed the rate discrepancies that providers, doctors, and hospitals get paid. And so we think we're going to need to encourage folks to consider um, moving on that issue to try to understand how to level the playing field so that value-driven organizations have the resources that they need to be competitive in the marketplace. All right, so Secretary Ash, let me ask you this question from a legislative perspective. Are we on the right path? Uh, I'm very excited about the future on any number of fronts. I'm excited because, again, uh, the, we, the cooperation that exists um, today um, is um, creating opportunities to have uh, high-level discussions that uh, I would argue haven't happened before. So, you know, many states and, and certainly in Washington, it seems like uh, so much energy is spent on fighting with each other that uh, it's difficult to find the time to actually uh, do anything about the real problems that are before you um, here. You know, both, the, uh, both on the administration side with the governor and the Senate president and the speaker, um, are working collaboratively and, and spend more time about good public policy than they do about uh, good politics. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited about it. Uh, you know, we, we, we all have challenges. There. Rick's, I thought Rick's speech was excellent, uh, first uh, in terms of um, the, the substance of it, but um, also identifying that there are very good things happening in Massachusetts, and we can all be proud. But never can you say that you're done 
uh, making improvements. And so, you know, it's the challenges of the budget writers, it's the challenges of the economic development officials, it's the challenges of the people that are involved in infrastructure, and it's the challenges of, of half of state government, the health and human services sector, uh, to figure out how to do things. The, the thing that I hope you all recognize, um, and it's taken me as somebody who's been in government all my, uh, government all my life uh, to realize, is that we are at a point in this state with the leadership that we all have that we recognize that we don't have all the answers. And that's why we spend so much time with AIM and the Business Roundtable and other, uh, other associations. That's why we're out talking to all of you uh, about uh, your observations and your needs. For our economic development plan that we put together, the governor signed uh, this past December called Opportunities for All, the governor said to me when he hired me, he said, Jay, I know you can put together an economic development plan for the state, but I want you not to do that. What I want you to do is I want you to go around the state and talk to as many businesses as you can, as many civic leaders as you can, as many people as you can about what their hopes and aspirations are uh, for the economy. So I am, a, a, and as a result of that, talked to more than 1,000 people. Many of you contributed to the plan, and it's very exciting what the plan is. I'm excited about where we are here. There are real problems ahead of us, but there are serious people who are contributing to very good public policy debate, and um, I would bet on Massachusetts uh, just the way that I'll bet on the Patriots uh, tomorrow. Uh, Brooke, wherever you are. Brooke's here, a Kansas, a Kansas City Chiefs fan. Where, where are you, Brooke? She's not, she's not standing up. Um, I'd, bet on, <laughs> I'd, bet on, uh, I'd bet on Massachusetts uh, um, uh, in the short term and in the long term because of the innovation that we have, the uh, collegial uh, spirit that we have, and the endowments we have. And the endowments we have, to quote uh, my good friend Senator Markey, the endowments we have is that Massachusetts is a brain state. And we're going to figure it out as long as we keep on working together. Uh, one of our other critical costs is utility costs. And companies, Martha, like yours, pay some of the highest rates in the Commonwealth. Um, how do electric rates, utility rates, affect your ability to grow your company? Look, I would be disingenuous to say it's a huge headwind after what I just said about the growth of Sensata, and we're, and we're doing pretty well on that front. You know, so, so it has us doing the things that probably every business should do in terms of focus on efficiency and savings. And we look at double-digit efficiency improvement, you know, year over year, driven by a lot of technology. So lighting and mecha uh, our mechanicals, our, our boiler, our, our chillers, all of those things have gotten more efficient over time. Having said that, I will tell you, just pragmatically, what happens inside the business is we have processes and activities that are more energy intensive than others. And so when you look at expanding, let's say, our engineering labs, where we're doing a lot of thermal testing and a lot of things that consume a lot of en um, energy, and we look at our options, given the choice, we're gonna actually take that particular activity and, uh, and as Rick said, it's not a lot of jobs, but it is jobs, and those will end up happening elsewhere. So it's a real issue, and um, I, you know, I, I think it's one we need to continue to pay attention to. Doctor, would, would that affect your ability to grow as well? Utility, utility costs? costs? Drive by Leahy in Burlington sometime <laughs> at night and see how many lights are on. <laughs> uh, uh, absolutely, it's a huge expense for us, and um, let me describe for just one second the, the business proposition for healthcare right now. If, if we're getting paid, which most healthcare health systems are getting paid, essentially the same amount year over year for taking care of the same patients. Uh, Medicare is paying us consistently less than we received previously. Our commercial contracts, because of the legislation I described, have us seeing um, on average about a 1% increase per year. And you're saying to yourself, well, if I'm paying 8 or 9% more, why are the hospitals and the doctors only getting paid 1% more? Um, I'll defer to the insurance companies on, on that subject. Um, my cost of pharmaceuticals, anybody from pharma in the, in the, uh, in the audience? Uh, hands are not as high as I would like them to be. <laughs> I, I was budgeted last year. Now remember, I'm getting paid essentially the same amount for delivering the same care. I was budgeted for a 9% increase in my pharmaceutical costs last year, and my actual experience was 15%. The first three months of this fiscal year, I'm up another 15%. And I don't get paid a nickel more in the hospital for delivering that care. I want to pay a competitive wage to my employees. I want to be able to maintain their benefits for them. It's a very, 
val very challenging proposition right now for sustainability for health care providers right. under the current circumstances. Mr. Secretary, we, we had talked, or Rick had talked in his speech about um, the climate, the business climate in Massachusetts and getting the climate, the, the energy to extend all the way from to the New York border. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with his assessment and in, in how, how to get there and where we are right now? Yeah, I agree with everything that Rick said. In fact, I'm going to ask the governor if he'll use Rick's speech for the state of the state address <laughs> next Thursday uh, because I, I agree with everything uh, that Rick said. Uh, priorities that uh, AIM um, have uh, laid out are around training. The governor talks constantly about workforce. Um, in those uh, visits that I made with all of you and, and others like you, um, I asked you all, what's the single most uh, uh, critical thing to the future growth of of your companies and universally you said workforce and so we're going to uh, uh, continue to focus on workforce and the governor's going to have more to say uh, about that on Thursday. Uh, Rick talked about infrastructure and um, all kidding aside about traffic, um, the good news is that we have lots of people who are going to work. Uh, the bad news is that we're traveling over roadways that were designed in the 50s. Uh, we need to do more about that. And so um, somebody mentioned, you mentioned the MBTA, which was interesting. Somebody from Attleboro mentioned the MBTA. Shows how enlightened she is because if we do not fix the MBTA, every community is going to suffer as a result, whether you're serviced by the MBTA or not because it's less dollars that we have to make improvements to our roadway system and, and add additional public transportation links along the way. Um, so Rick is right on about infrastructure. We're fully aware of it, and we have a great secretary and a, a great team uh, back at the State House who are, are working on that. Uh, Rick talked about the regulatory environment, and uh, Secretary Lepore is, is leading a regulatory review process right now of each of the something like 2,250 regulations that exist. We in government continue to tell you in the business uh, world uh, how to do things. Well, uh, this administration, led by uh, Secretary Lepore, is saying uh, that's going to change. And uh, in March, she will announce something that will be uh, pretty spectacular, uh, pretty remarkable when you think about the way that uh, uh, the relationship between government and, and business uh, has been in, in the past. And on the competitive thing, um, health care costs are really important. But what you're going to, I want to talk about just for a second is energy. Um, the governor is going to include in his state of the, city, uh, state, of the state address on Thursday um, a major piece about energy. Um, the reason why I hope all of you are in this room together is that you feel a kinship around AIM, and AIM is a conduit by which you can um, not only voice uh, your support for a, a better energy policy than what we have now, but actually do something about it. Uh, AIM is at the table making a difference on the discussion about energy, and we need to do something about it. We need clean energy, we need reliable energy, we need renewable energy, but we also need energy that is cost effective. And until we do that, we can't be satisfied. So one of those things that we still have to check off is dealing with energy. The governor's filed a bill on hydro. Uh, hydro is all of those things that I just said um, and is, and is uh, readily available. Um, there are other opportunities to look at um, renewables and other ways to deliver energy. Uh, we all need to collectively uh, be heard um, on energy and we can uh, make a difference. So, in general, agree with everything that Amos said. Uh, I am literally going to dust off uh, Rick's name off of the speech and give <laughs> the speech uh, next week at the Metro South Chamber of Commerce. So anyone that uh, was planning on going, don't bother. You're going to hear the same speech. Uh, but uh, all of us uh, working collectively, we can make a difference on those issues. Jeff, can I just jump sure. in for one second? The, the, uh, the comment that you make about the state's ability to invest in roads, infrastructure, and BTA, if you look at the, and it's a, a slide from the um, State Health Policy Commission, if you look at the state budget 2001 versus 2011, mm -hmm. and you compare the health care expenditures by the state, state has spent during that time period was spending five, um, over $5 billion per, per year more than they were a decade earlier. At the same time, state's ability to invest in roads, infrastructure, police, fire safety um, related um, necessary state services decreased by a comparable amount. The cost of health care in Massachusetts is cannibalizing the Commonwealth's ability to make the investments in the types of things are, that are so critically important for your businesses and for the well-being of the Commonwealth. Um, it's not inevitable that health care costs will continue to grow if you all bear the responsibility for looking, that issue, at looking at that issue and understanding your options, but you have to invest as the leaders of your businesses 
in understanding what your options are. You do not need to compromise quality, and you can reduce the costs. It's not inevitable. You have to pay attention to the issue. There are dozens of topics we could talk about for several hours up here today, but uh, let's open it up for, for questions from everybody here. There are microphones, and the microphones will get to you, but if you have a follow-up to anything that we discussed here or fresh topics, uh, we welcome the questions. I do want to follow up. I do want to follow up on the uh, issue of uh, compensation uh, that our colleague from Sensata brought up. There's been a number of proposals about sort of a one-size-fits-all approach to that. I wonder if you could maybe tease that out a little bit about what it means to the private sector to be essentially ordered how to do something rather than something that's tailored to your business, your industry, and your the market that you serve. Sure. Let, let me just start by saying, look, let, let's accept that behind all of that is the right intention. I think we all understand what is the end result we're trying to get to. And from my perspective, and I'll say it again, you know, having a thriving culture, having it be a diverse culture, diversity of perspectives, it's hugely important. We compete in a global world. Most of our competitors, none of our competitors are in North America, by the way. Most of our revenue is actually outside of North America. So what you need to compete in that environment is not a whole bunch of guys that all look the same, that went to the same schools, that studied the same things. It doesn't work. But we have to have the ability to execute. <laughs> no, 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 uh, no, no bad intention, guys. I got a lot of you in my business, too. <laughs> We could not be where we are if we didn't embrace that notion. And so we have to have the latitude then to say, how do we keep a, a team in place that is passionate about winning, that is engaged, and that believes in our meritocracy because we pay for performance. We pay for results. You know, and so that's, that is exactly the issue, whether it's around pay equity or whether it's around non-compete. There is not a one-size-fits-all. So, so how do we cooperate to say, look, this is the way you should be monitoring us to make sure that we're being fair and we're treating our employees well. This is the way you ought to look at us. When we get into a high degree of prescriptiveness, that becomes really dysfunctional and it, and it really does suck up the bandwidth. Question over here. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Warner Maywald with Renaissance Advisory. Uh, back to the healthcare topic. Uh, there was an interesting post uh, on a famous social media website about if we raised everyone's taxes by 1%, all our healthcare problems would be resolved. Well, uh, I made the mistake of posting back, why don't we just cut costs? I think it's a more effective practice long term. And coincidentally, I got the same response with those four letter adjectives. <laughs> uh, so I thought I'd like to get your take. I'll open it up to you. Uh, you know, employers face a issue all the time, not just about healthcare costs, but budgeting these costs in general throughout the year as they create budgets. And so the bigger demon is, even though we may be able to control healthcare costs, what is the underlying effect of spending that dollar relative to uh, contributing, contributing to our pension plans? So as an advisor, I'd like to get your take. Are we just spinning dollars here? Or do we need to make our healthcare more uh, efficient rather than providing more to everyone, which we're doing already? I'd like to get your thoughts on how we can control that process. Well, let me answer the, the, the uh, respond to the last thing you mentioned. Massachusetts should be unbelievably proud that nearly 98% of people in the Commonwealth have health insurance. That is not the way it, it is elsewhere in the country. So there are very few people who go to sleep at night in Massachusetts worrying that if, heaven forbid, their child gets sick, that it will be a financial catastrophe for them. So. Um, pat your, yourselves on the back. It's spectacular what Massachusetts has done. With that said, that requires a level of responsibility in the way healthcare costs are managed if you've made a commitment to provide that security to the residents of the Commonwealth. Let me give you concrete examples of what we're trying to do within Leahy Health, which I challenge all of my colleagues to do all the time. Some organizations um, take us up on it and, and, and others don't. We are doing everything we can within our organization to make sure that the right care is delivered in the right place at the right time. That means not compromising the quality, 
and delivering the care at a lower cost, and often delivering the care in the community hospital setting um, so that patients can be closer to their home, closer to their families in a lower cost setting and supporting the community institution. We actually do reverse transfers of patients from Leahy and Burlington, which is a tertiary, more complicated center, to our um, affiliated organizations, Beverly, Addison, Gilbert Hospital up in Gloucester and Winchester. Last year, transported over 1,000 patients back in the reverse direction, always subject to patient choice, never impose our will upon a patient. Um, if they've got a primary care doctor in that community, that's where they ought to get their care. Um, and when you um, ask around, that's not something that's typically done. We're a not-for-profit asset of the Commonwealth, and we've got a responsibility to the Commonwealth to do everything we can to, to deliver care um, in the most cost-efficient fashion, even in, when it's not to our financial benefit to do so. Um, and I think you all ought to ask the hospitals and the doctors with whom you um, deliver um, most of your patients, your employees to them, and ask them what they're doing to reduce the costs. And some of them are delivering um, spectacular initiatives along those lines, but others are not. It is manageable, um, and we don't need to compromise coverage for everybody, and we can level off the costs and, in fact, reduce the costs over time. Okay, next question over here. Hi, thanks very much. I'm Tim Leshen from Northeastern University. This is a been a great panel. Um, Jay, you, you mentioned the economic development plan that the governor recently put out, which I think is great. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how uh, universities like ours and many others uh, can factor into that to work with you on that in terms of both on the employment side, in terms of talent, as well as on the research side. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Tim. Uh, so uh, you've heard uh, one size doesn't fit all a couple times uh, on the stage. Uh, I'm living proof that one size doesn't fit all. <laughs> uh, spent a lifetime buying clothes and trying them on and giving them to other people after they don't fit. Um, as the governor and I, uh, who also experiences the same problem, um, uh, set about uh, thinking about the uh, uh, economic development strategy for the Commonwealth, uh, what we quickly arrived at uh, was that a, a one-size-fits-all approach uh, to the Commonwealth's uh, economic needs weren't going to work. Uh, for those of you who have been in my office, 21st floor on the tallest building of Beacon Hill, um, I uh, look straight out and I see the Charles River in Kendall Square out of one window. Out of my other window, I look out, I see uh, downtown Boston and the Seaport District. Uh, if I sat in my office and just always operated on the impression of what I see out of those two windows, uh, I would think the Massachusetts economy is doing great. Um, as we drive around the rest of the state, we see that there are uh, vast differences. And so what we have come up with is an approach that is based upon uh, regional uh, regions being strong um, and then tying those regions into a fabric that is Massachusetts. Long way, Tim, to getting to um, where uh, Northeastern and other institutions fit in. In those regions are regional stewards. I couldn't agree with you more, and thank you for articulating. Hospitals have been an important part of regional economies, and we need to uh, figure out uh, how to help those uh, hospitals uh, that are still the largest employers in the economic engines in their regions do well. But we also need to t tap into hospitals. We need to tap into colleges and universities. We need to tap into the business community to come up with regional plans uh, that then help us to uh, promote vitality there and throughout the Commonwealth. What we're doing as part of our uh, our work now in implementing the plan is uh, looking at sectors uh, of the economy by region uh, to identify uh, where the clusters are uh, that we can support and build that ecosystem uh, that supports the cluster and allows for uh, growth in that cluster. Um, we very much would love to see uh, what's happening in Kendall Square, happening in Springfield or Chicopee or Pittsfield, uh, but it may take several decades for that to happen. In the meantime, we need to make sure that what can grow from the region can grow. We think that our eds and meds are an important part of that. We think that tapping into businesses that are already em employing many, you think about an employer of a thousand in Attleboro, that's a terrific resource to have uh, on the south coast and we need to uh, build upon that. Uh, being able to develop those resources from within, first to make sure that they remain healthy, but then to be able to branch out and uh, create a, a greater economic vitality is an important part of it, and our institutions of uh, higher learning will be that. The second thing, if I could, just quickly on uh, institutions of higher learning. Um, we're an innovation state. We're the brain state, in part because we've been endowed with great institutions. 
the governor jokes all the time that the, the state strategy was to find uh, two great schools and then wait 400 years for them to take hold. Um, fortunately, uh, when he jokes, it's not two great schools, it's, it's, it's more than 100 great schools. So um, the innovation that's happening in places like Northeast and at MIT, at WPI, at UMass, Tom Chamorro is here from UMass, and uh, Marty Meehan was a big part of our effort uh, to bring GE here, as was AIM and, and uh, others in the room. Uh, Verizon, we stopped in and uh, showed um, the people from GE what the possibilities were for innovation uh, in Massachusetts. Um, we have uh, great uh, universities here as an endowment. We don't have oil from Texas. We don't have sunshine from Florida. But what we have is we have great educational institutions. And the innovation that Tim is working on and others are working on uh, is going to make sure that we're able to continue to promote the vitality we need here. Great questions. Next one right in the middle. Yes, uh, Mike Hogan from the Make Peace Companies down in uh, Plymouth County. Um, thinking, uh, reacting to the GE decision this week reminded me of um, Paul Severino about 15 years ago, uh, a board member at AIM at that time, uh, running a technology telecommunications company in Massachusetts, went to the Bay Area to run uh, a successor company. And at the time, he talked about the Bay Area was always going to beat Massachusetts because of the culture of collaboration and innovation. And in fact, I think the headline was, we can't compete because we're too old and too cold. So <laughs> what, what's happened in the last 15 years that's changed that from uh, your perspectives? And what are the lessons that we can uh, export to Attleboro, to New Bedford, to Holyoke? Because th th that's less than a generation. Uh, to have the center of gravity, especially in eds and meds and biotechnology and innovation, now come full circle back to Massachusetts. Okay, I'll, I'll, come, I'll take that one uh, to lead off. It's a, I'd love to hear you it's a conversation that's near and dear to my heart. I was actually out in Silicon Valley about two weeks ago, and we were having the debate. And I finally said, look, I'll, I'll make you a bet. I'll make you a bet that we'll deal with our infrastructure and our health care cost issues faster than you deal with the lack of water. <laughs> <laughs> and, my, <laughs> it's a little bit tongue in cheek, but the, the, the conversation was, and there is something in the DNA here, okay? And it is about pragmatic problem solving. So this is my own perspective. Every, every city, every region can fall into the trap of being fairly insular. I actually grew up in the Detroit area, so your comment around okay. Detroit was pretty in interesting. And that, that place became so insular that it took all kinds of outsiders, from Alan Mulally, you know, to, to even folks from the government, to go in and say things have got to change. There is some of that that happens in Silicon Valley as well. So the notion that it's fast, that you get there quick, that you get out fast, that you start another one, there's some real value in that. But it is not the only way to grow businesses. And it's not the only way to have viable technologies. And some of these problems, you're not going to do in a six-month startup. These are real problems that we're dealing with. So if you think about the biomedical, if you think about mission-critical sensors that are going to drive your car and you're not going to have your hands on the wheel, you don't want to have some startup that just got into that, you know, <laughs> deciding that they're going to be in the automotive business. So there is something here to draw on. And that's, that's a little bit, um, you know, perspective. That's a little bit intuitive. But I do think that that's, that's part of the answer. I'm sure there are some better ones from the panel. Yeah, i just uh, ask you a question now. Uh, how, how many times have you gotten calls from other states or other, uh, other states, I guess, but uh, certainly other regions that, that you should be there instead of here? And, and what do you think when you get those calls? You, you know, it's, um, the, everybody's trying to do their job, right? right. And so you listen to, I, I do it the same way I look at a competitor that I'm competing against in the business. And I tell me, I ask the question, compare and contrast. Why do you think you're better? What's actually better about that? And then we'll come right back into places like AIM and say, OK, they had a point here. In other areas, they, they don't necessarily. So what I think is really important, you heard about our 100-year-old history. You have a 100-year-old history. The ability to adapt and get stronger based on real-time feedback, I think, is pretty important. Mm, that's great. The thing, uh, to, to, to Mike's question, by the way, uh, when I talk about 
uh, the, the decades and generations of work. And, you know, Mike Hogan is the former executive director of uh, Mass Development and former Mayor Marlboro. And Marlboro is just a shining example of, uh, of what the possibilities are. And arguably, the success that Marlboro has had, including having GE and Marlboro, uh, makes a difference when GE decides to come here. You know, uh, I'm, I'm fond of, uh, I, I, I administer by slogans. And one of the slogans that I remind myself of all the time is it's evolution, not revolution. Um, New York City is trying to um, uh, take the revolutionary approach. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg at the time got up and said, hey, we're going to be the greatest at this and, and had all kinds of pizzazz about what was going to happen. And yet we, the history of us in Massachusetts is to continue to plot along the way, to analyze what the issues are and find ways to overcome those issues. And that's exactly what is happening in the innovation uh, world now. So uh, when I think about the uh, evolution that's taken place here and how we continue uh, to rebuild um, our economy and continue to um, find new ways of doing things smarter, better, uh, less expensive, and more impactful. Um, it's a natural that we would continue on uh, to the place we are. The thing that's happened at this particular time is that while we have always valued innovation, a state and the businesses here, um, I don't think the free market has always valued innovation the way that we now do. Um, in the way that the market does. So there was a time where everybody had to leave here to find lower cost labor, and yet they're making their way back. Why? Because of quality, because of innovation. Um, and so we stayed the course on innovation as being an important part of what we did. We continue to work in our higher educational institutions. You all continue to search for new ways to, uh, to do things better. And the ecosystem that developed uh, became a real strong ecosystem. I'd like to think that one person had this great idea, but it wasn't. It was all of us finding our way together around innovation that's made the difference. And now uh, that we're here in this place at this time where innovation is so important, um, we are able to uh, attract GE, attract substantial uh, money from the federal government around uh, manufacturing. The federal government has, has put together a, a manufacturing uh, uh, initiative to bring ma uh, manufacturing around uh, innovation and technology uh, back to the United States and we are continually winning those uh, uh, those um, challenges. Uh, flexible electronics we've won, photonics we've won, and, and uh, there's an, uh, an announcement soon on revolutionary fibers, uh, fibers that will tell whether we're hot or cold and be able to turn on or turn off depending on what we need or that our kid, uh, our baby has uh, got a fever or needs to be changed, uh, those types of things. And, and so it's all of that, Michael. It's not one thing, right? It's not one person, but it's all of it together. And we recognize that that's all in that special sauce now, and we're able to create uh, uh, new recipes because of that. So we're wildly innovative in Massachusetts healthcare, um, more so arguably than any other place in the world. Um, with that said, the, the component of the healthcare ecosystem that is not wildly innovative is um, everybody believing that they should have unfettered choice to get care wherever they want, whenever they want, at whatever cost, and somehow miraculously we're all going to pay for it. You want to make more investments in your companies, you got to lower your healthcare costs. Because as a percentage of your total expenses, um, I know in my business where I spend $115 million a year on health care benefits for my 15,000 employees, we are innovating on a daily basis to try to encourage our employees to keep themselves well, to avoid unnecessary care, and to make value-based decisions as to where they get their care. Um, so that's the innovation in healthcare where nobody's going to ask us to pick up and move Leahy Health System to Silicon Valley. That's not happening anytime soon. But I challenge you all to be innovative in that component of your business. Be as attentive to that issue as you are to the utility costs, as you are to your real estate costs, as you are to um, your workforce costs, because you have the ability to drive the performance and therefore make new investment if you can control um, probably the one portion of your expense which you believe is not in your control right now. The fact of the matter is it is in your control if you pay attention to it.